Okay, thanks. Um, let's see if we can fit everything in this 20 minutes. Uh, it's a bit uh, tough to follow after Phil's last talk with all the energy and everything, but I'll try to, to make it uh, interesting. So, uh, yeah, I work for Be Real. It's a production company, and we do all kinds of uh, interactive uh, digital experiences on the web. You might have seen them. Um, so cool things using Canvas, WebGL, uh, web audio, even like native Android applications. So we're also hiring, so if you're interested, uh, hit me up. And I'm going to be talking about shaders. So a shader is basically like the definition. It's a computer program that is used to do shading. Uh, when, we do sh when we mean shading, it's like the traditional concept of drawing. When we use uh, visual cues to determine how an object it feels in 3D, like uh, we do some kind of uh, coloring and shadowing to make it feel 3D in the paper, which is a 2D surface. Uh, uh, so the agreed definition uh, for a shader is a computer program that tells the computer how to draw something. This comes from the Renderman specification 3.0 from Pixar in 1988. Uh, you probably are familiar with Pixar's work. So in that specification, they define what would be uh, what they will be using for their uh, graphic pipeline. So uh, for all these uh, pictures and, and features they do, they're using shaders uh, as procedures to create everything that they show on screen. So they use it for surfacing, which is what gives a, a, a surface the, the, the appearance of being wood or metal, uh, textures, lighting, shadowing, um, modify um, geometry, so it, there's animation for characters. Everything is done with shaders. So for instance, this is an example of, of how render merge shaders are defined. Uh, you're not familiar with this language. It doesn't have to be any specific language, but you can see that, uh, for instance, this um, red on the, on, on the left, uh, it's just an output of a program that says that the output, it's uh, three colors, three components, RGB. The first one is one, so it's just red, and the opacity is one, so it's solid. And this one on the, on the right, it's a bit more complex and does the same thing, but adds a function called diffuse that calculates the adequate, like the correct lighting for that uh, object given a, a light. So same thing, changes the color, changes the opacity, and what you get is like that object that looks shaded. So shaders do mostly, mainly two things. Uh, they do geometry transformation. We have a uh, definition of what we call a geometry. It would be a cube, it would be a, a car, it would be a plane, it would be anything that you can think of. And it would place it in the right position in the world uh, relative to your, the camera, which would be your eye. So it would make the perspective, tran perspective transformation, which makes things look uh, smaller if they're far away, or distort objects if you have some kind of animation. And they also do color output. So they take the information they have, and they decide how that pixel uh, should be lit. Like, what's the color? Is it, um, is it, I don't know, is it metal? Is it reflecting something? Is it red? Is it uh, transparent? Because it's like uh, an exhaust uh, of, of a spaceship. So we're going to try to do a bit of introduction on 3D programming. This is, so don't worry. There's no, there's no algebra. There's no anything. Uh, if you think about this like, like um, building, like buildings, for instance, there's the architecture side. Uh, which would be like how you do everything. That would be like the algebra and calculus. But you're actually also, when you're building, your laying bricks. So that's what we're going to talk about, like how a graphic pipeline works. So you start with, a, with basically with a, some array of values that represent the geometry. In this case, what we're using here, it's a simple square. It's, it's just flat. It doesn't have depth. So you have all each of these uh, corners, these white points, it's uh, its position in 3D space. They are just all X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. So this is how we define our, our geometry. So what we do is tell the vertex shader, OK, you're going to take this geometry, these this four points, and you're going to use this reference as where's the camera, where's the object, and you're going to create the projection. You're going to put those four points into the right position given my camera. So you can see that they are like a bit uh, tilted. But this is still not uh, this is still not an object. This is, still, this is just still mathematical values that exist in memory. They don't have any, any meaning yet. So we have to tell the, the system how we want to draw those four points. What, what do they mean? They could be four points floating in space. They could be joined by wireframe lines. So they would be like a wireframe uh, square. Or they could be solid because we're drawing a window or we're drawing a, a wall. So we choose solid. And once we get this, uh, that's 
when we're beginning to get into something more physical, now that we have that projected square, we need to put it on a display. We need to show it to the user. So uh, we're going to turn it into something that adequates to the screen, to the final display. So we get this into this. This is like calculating exactly what, what of your pixels in your display are going to be covered by this uh, primitive that we've transformed. So once the system has that, it can, it can say which pixels are going to be actually drawn. Then it calls the vertex shader, uh, the fragment shader, sorry. And that fragment shader has like a texture, has like a light information, and it goes pixel by pixel, drawing uh, according to each value what it should be on that pixel. So that's how everything is separated. The result goes, is an image that goes into a, a frame buffer. Uh, it doesn't go directly to, to screen, it's a, a frame buffer. And we mean frame buffer because we might be using that for other uh, uses. So once we have that frame buffer, we might decide, is it going into the screen? Is it going into another shader? So we can do lots of things with that. But the process is like this. So the things that we have, all these operations that are executed on the vertex shader, and all these operations that are calculated on the fragment shader. Usually, how things are done, uh, vertex shader, it's cheaper, or fragment shader, it's more intensive, just because of the numbers, because usually your geometry has a few hundred thousand poly, uh, vertices, and your screen, like nowadays, there, it's got several uh, dozen million pixels. Like a retina display, it's, it's a huge amount of surface that you have to, to lead. So usually you try to look for uh, less, uh, less calculations, like a heavy load on the vertex shader if you can, and the, um, try to keep it uh, not too expensive on the fragment shader. So uh, until now, this is, like, like a, this is not actually a system. This is more like a pattern. This is something that, that it's, it, uh, you can implement on any system. You can say, OK, this is how we want to work. Then we have the GPU. The GPU is uh, using this pattern, implementing it in a specific way and then uh, take me, taking these things into a way faster uh, process. So the, the same way we, we have the data in, in, in geometry, we have a specific format for images, uh, for camera positions, for um, uh, matrix transformations, everything is there. And then we get that from the main CPU memory, our main memory where we usually work, and we upload it to the GPU memory. That's kind of key. So the way that GPUs are really, really fast is because they can work with things that they have on their own memory. They don't have to do the round trip through the bus uh, from GPU memory to CPU memory. So usually shaders are bundled into programs. You create a program that says, is, I'm going to use this vertex shader. I'm going to use this fragment shader. And uh, you take a geometry bundled with that uh, program bundled with different values like textures and matrices and all that and say, okay, draw this. And when you get that, then the GPU is drawing an actual object. So you take like, I have, I have this sphere definition, I've got this program that says that it's made of wood, I have this texture, I have this light, make it together, put on the screen a, 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 sphere, a sphere that looks like wood. So basically you have to tell the GPU how to actually execute all that. Once you've got everything there on the GPU, all is in place, you have to tell, okay, take this, take this, take this, do this. Take this, take this, take this, do that. So that's, that's your, that's your uh, function as a programmer. Uh, can, can we for a moment admire that so 90 image of an agent like floating down a computer, big as a screen, big as mechanical keyboard, trying to hack something? It's mind blowing, like so naive. So the, the key of this is that once you've got everything running, the GPUs don't have w just one CPU to process all this. They have a lot of different small chips like cores that can execute any vertex shader or fragment shader code. So they execute everything in parallel. So basically, that image that we were creating uh, before, it's getting split across different cores, and then it's uh, rendered in parallel. So that's what makes things much, much faster, because you can get to 64, 128, or many, many more units that run in parallel. That's what makes GPUs so fast. So WebGL shaders. Uh, this is specifically the ones that we're using in, in, in JavaScript in the browser. They're based on open, OpenGL ES2.0. It's the one that runs on your phones, on your, or more or less on the mobile systems. It's a JavaScript API. The shaders are coded in GLSL. It's kind of C. It's a subset of, of a very specific syntax. Uh, and WebGL programs have vertex and fragment shaders. You always have to do those two. So writing shaders, it's 
kind of easy. Once you get into that, you don't really have to know how to, but the syntax is pretty much easy. But the WebGL code, it's pretty, pretty verbose. So using 3.js, for instance, makes things much, much easier. So for instance, this would be how you would use uh, a standard shader, a standard material uh, with 3.js. You would create the scene, uh, you would create your camera, you would create your render, which is a WebGL renderer, attach it to your DOM, create a geometry that is a box geometry, or one square unit, a material that in this case, it's a texture material with a map, and uh, create your cube, which takes that box geometry, that material, and just renders it. So what you get from this, it's basically this. It's a box with a texture that it's spinning. But it's, it's, it's kind of easy to, to, once you've got all the shaders in place, like everything that is executed takes care of that, the GPU. So there's, with 3GS, there's a lot more different materials, uh, so, which are essentially shaders in itself. Uh, you've got mesh basic material, the one you've seen, uh, depth material, renders the distance from the camera, it's very useful for many effects. Lambert material, mm, diffuse, uh, it's a diffuse material, like, like this floor. Uh, mesh foam material, it's something that's more like glass or metal. And we have three shader material and three raw shader material, which is used for you to create your own uh, shaders. So it's exactly the same way as before, create the scene, the camera, the renderer, and geometry, and, but the material, instead of being one of the default materials, it's just a uh, shader material. And we specify which uniforms are we gonna use? So like in this instance, it's the texture that is gonna be used by the shader, the fragment shader, and then we specify which is the source for the vertex shader and for the fragment shader. And then everything takes, takes care and it's rendered all the same. So in this case, for instance, the vertex shader would, be, would look something like this. This is an actual WebGL uh, shader. So we have the, the position of the vertex. We have a texture coordinate for that vertex. Uh, and basically what the function does, it creates the, the position of that projected uh, vertex. So we take that, put it on, it's according to the object, the camera and everything, it's there. And the fragment shader just basically reads from the texture the, uh, the correct uh, texture, the correct coordinate and puts it on screen. So that's basically it, same as before. And everything's run some, running on parallel on, on the GPU. So if you're doing that with, with JavaScript and you want to have your shaders with your own code, in, unless you have like a proper shader loader, usually what you do is uh, use the script tag with a different type, in this case like x shader slash x vertex and x shader, sorry, it's x fragment, the second one. Uh, that way the interpreter doesn't, like it will skip those two tags and then what you will do is get the script tag and check the text content uh, to load it into your shader material. So that way you can have it's a bit messy, but it gets, it gets the, the things done. So, post-processing. Uh, it's a very similar case of this, like this, uh, but your geometry is just a, a quad, like a flat polygon that's in front of the camera. It doesn't have projection. It takes uh, some image as the source, usually the image that you're rendering, and then it plays with it, like it changes something. So in this case, we had our vertex shader with a, the flag geometry and the flag texture. We got that flag rendered. That image, it's turned into a texture that it gets sent to the next stage, which is a vertex shader with that flat geometry. And the texture, it's the pre-rendered flag and just changes the colors. So post-processing, it's this kind of chain uh, of, of shaders that do modifications. So, uh, yeah, there's many examples that you can check for playing with shaders on the internet, shader toy, GLS and sandbox. Um, but we're not, not done yet, and I'm gonna try to skip really, really fast through this. So, that's the great, the great thing of, of, of shaders. We're not limited to graphical output. So everything looks like everything you're trying to do, it's putting some geometry, some textures, and render a car or, or a game on, on, on screen. But that's not actually, that's entirely true. Because basically we're trying to render, it's any arbitrary data. So textures are in itself just uh, memory buffers. So you can put any memory that you, can, that, that you want there, and then you can do any operation that you want on your fragment shader. So that's what we call GPGPU, General Purpose Computing on Graphics Processing Units. There's a few frameworks like CUDA or OpenCL, but they're not available entirely yet for the, for the browser. So in the meantime, we can do kind of the same thing with WebGL. So same as the post-processing, we just create this quad that's gonna be like the output buffer that we want to modify. We create uh, an output that is exactly the same size as our input buffer in width and height, and we just execute each fragment for each one of the values. So basically, imagine that you have this uh, input, this uh, 
this uh, array of numbers, 25, 9, 3, 6, 1, and our fragment shader executes the, the square root. So we will have on the output, on the graphical output, uh, 5, 3, 6, 1. So uh, mm, this is too much, this is too much. Anyhow, so how do we get data into, 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 the, into the, the shader? So we can create the flow32 uh, array, typed arrays for JavaScript. We can put any code we want there. That's our float. And then we can create a shader. And same, same, same thing, only that our input texture is going to be a data texture. So it's a way of telling the system that this is what we're going to do. It's actual values that I want you to treat differently. It's not an image. So then, for instance, our vertex shader, it's pretty much pretty simple. It just does the, the, the projection, puts the quote on the screen, nothing there. And then the fragment shader is a bit different. So if you check your, the main, what it does is it reads from the input texture, which is our actual data texture. It decodes the float value that we've encoded in that texture, executes the calculate function, which is a square root, or it could be many, many complex things, and returns the, the same, the, the evaluated value, value into a float. And that's how we get it. Then we have to run it, and it's the same as before. We have a renderer, we have a scene, a camera, a geometry, which is a quad. We create a result, which is a render target, because we don't want that to go into the screen. We just want to take it so we can read it. So that's our result. Then we can read back from the GPU memory. Once we get that uh, result of, of the fragment shader, this is actual WebGL code. There's no code for 3.js to do in this. But basically what you do, it's like bind that buffer, read it back, turn it into a flow32 array, and then you have exactly what's the, uh, being calculated by the, by, the, by the shader. So examples, nice. Um, Basically, what, what I'm doing here, it's, the, it's like an array map. I'm providing a, a, a set of values, like an array, and I'm executing the map function, the JavaScript map function, with something that I'm providing. So I can type uh, something here. So for instance, my function is going to be um, return the, the value. So now it's going to execute it uh, on, I think it's 60 million floats. It just did that. And we have, like, it took 2.7 seconds on the CPU, like an array dot map with this, and running on the GPU, it took 975 uh, milliseconds, so three times maybe, three, three, three times faster. Considering that it took the setup, so setting everything for the WebGL context, running with everything that, all these 16.7 million floats, and fetching back from the GPU memory, which as you can see, it's pretty, pretty high value. But then what we can start doing, it's like doing more complex, um, uh, if, ah, sh 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 sorry. Can you make the text bigger? Yeah, sorry. Thank you. There we go. <laughs> so now we run uh, a square root on 16 million floats. It took 3.3 seconds on the CPU and it took 7, 0 0.7 seconds on the GPU. And actually, we've got a none, not a number zero here because it's, it's a negative number. Like our checking, it's, of course, there's no negative square root. Um, square root for negative numbers. But we can start doing, doing very, very weird things. Like if you've coded with, with, um, with functions like this, you know that these are usually very, very, very uh, expensive. So we can run it again. And it's, it's doing both, like CPU and then uh, GPU. So there we go. So it took 6.6 .6 seconds to calculate, six, one point, sorry, 16 million floats evaluated with that function, 6.6 .6 seconds on the CPU, one second on the GPU. So even if you have all that overhead of reading from the GPU, it's still worth it because it's, it's, this is linear, this is basically, it's constant across the resolution that you're doing and the complexity of the function doesn't really uh, increment that much on the GPU because the GPU is designed to really calculate all this. So for instance, the Lego website that we saw before, this could be very much uh, optimized with this system because what you're doing is taking an input buffer, doing some calculations, which are more, most of them are not related across the, the, the image. You're just evaluating that weighted uh, average of three pixels and outputting your, your, the, the model that they, they wanted to create. So even though they were using web workers, which is super nice, you can also use WebGL web workers. So you have to keep thinking of, of how you could improve if you have big data on your application, if you have on the front end many things that you want to calculate, like several millions, and it's being slow, 
WebGL shaders, it's a thing to consider. Um, it also runs on mobile, and, and I'm almost out of time. So this is me, and if you have any question, uh, hit me on Twitter, or I'll be upstairs. Thank you.